This technology is and will be life-changing and life-saving for so your many. Time has expired. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Thank you President. Time. Indeed. Yeah. My, <laughs> my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Yeah. I refer the Minister to two statements the Department put out on Tuesday night saying they did not actually rely on the website of a modern-day spiritual healer oh. when calculating the cost of a bargaining consultant. Is it just an amazing coincidence that the figure of $175 an hour that his department uses in the report is the figure mentioned on the Modern Day Spiritual oh, Healers website, which the department provides as a reference for in the regulatory impact statement? Will the minister take responsibility for this appalling error? Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, members, senators, I don't want to repeat of the shouting uh, that we had yesterday. The question's been asked. I'm going to call the minister in a moment and I expect him to be heard in respectful silence. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Dunningham, for the question. Well, another day and we have the opposition continuing to clutch at straws uh, to find any reason possible to stop workers in this country from getting a pay rise. Um, they will do anything to stop talking about workers getting a pay rise. They will stop anything, do anything to stop small businesses and medium-sized businesses being able to participate in a system that exists under their current legislation uh, to deliver pay rises for their workers, a more simple industrial relations system and a higher productivity for small businesses. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Point of order, uh, President. On relevance, I mean, the question was pretty clear around the source of the information and whether the minister will yep. take responsibility. Thank you, not the... Senator Dunningham. I will draw the minister to the question. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Now, as I say, the, uh, this is a continuation of what we saw yesterday from the opposition, uh, trying to find any possible reason, uh, whether it be websites or, 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 or people, consultants. What this is actually about is one of the false claims that the opposition has been making this week, which is their claim that it will cost small businesses $14,000 to participate in, in uh, multi-employer bargaining and medium-sized employers to pay even more. Now, you'll be surprised to hear that that's actually wrong, uh, because the way the, way the uh, laws are structured uh, allows for small businesses to have access to the cooperative workplaces stream, so that if a small business wants to go and engage a consultant, whoever that might be, uh, to assist them there with their results, then that's a matter for them. But what I think you'll find is that most small businesses are members of chambers of commerce, are members of industry associations, who would actually go and do the negotiations on their behalf, and then a small Order. business and then a small business would have the option of choosing to be part of that or not. Of course, if their workers would like to be a, a part of that, then the majority of those workers have to go through a process to support, that, uh, to support that option. They also have to go to the, the Fair Work Commission to get approval to do so. Uh, so this Minister idea, Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Point of order on relevance again, Madam President. Uh, oh. This business around everything Thank other you, than the answer Senator we Dunningham. asked for. Um, I will draw the minister back to the question, and I would ask those on my left to listen in silence. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, um, uh, President. So, as I say, the, what the opposition is saying is just, is just plain wrong, and I'll keep telling uh, you why. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Uh, I'm waiting. You have a senator on his feet, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, President. Uh, unbelievable. But uh, Aki, in terms of Chambers, released information yesterday showing the cost of a bargaining consultant is actually closer to $438 rather than $175 the figure uses on its data, making costs for small businesses higher than $20,000. Is the minister going to ask his department to fix the regulatory impact statement, or does the minister stand by the calculation? of the modern-day spiritual healer he references in his report. Uh, I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence, and those interjections are disorderly, Senator Ayres. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. I understand that this has given uh, the opposition a lot of amusement this week, but we don't think it's an amusing situation that for 10 years workers have had to get uh, by Senator without a pay Watt. rise. We Senator don't think Watt. it's an amusing situation. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have asked for silence 
and the minute the minister got to his feet, you were shouting louder than the minister who has a microphone on. I will ask again for there to be silence so that we can all hear the minister's answer. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Now, I'm not, I haven't seen that report from Aki, but if they are putting that sort of information out, then they are wrong uh, and they are misleading their members. Because what Aki know, uh, what Aki know, well, what Aki know, and what the opposition Watt. should know, uh, is that small businesses will have Minister access Watt, to the cooperative workplace. Minister Watt, I ask at the start of question time for there not to be a repeat of the disorder that was in the chamber yesterday during question time, and immediately we have the disorder back again. I'm going to ask for about the fourth time. For members on my left in particular to listen to the answers in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Aki should know, because they've been involved in these discussions, that small Watt, businesses will have Minister access Watt, to the cooperative workplace stream. Please resume your seat. And thank you, Senator Cash. You immediately started shouting again after I'd asked for silence. I'd asked for silence and some respect to the rulings of the chair. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. In fact, Aki is one of the organisations that will have every ability under this legislation to prepare a template agreement uh, for all small businesses to opt into under the Cooperative Workplaces stream. So is Aki telling us that not only they oppose a wage rise, all oh, shock horror, Aki have always supported pay rises, haven't they, but are they saying they're not prepared to play their role as an employer group to design a template agreement uh, that small businesses can, uh, can sign up to? That would be a very interesting uh, offer to their members. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Slamming Aki, great way to go. Will the minister put out uh, a new risk? Sorry, Senator, uh, on a point of order, Senator. That, that's debate. It's not the question. Can, the, can you please call them to the question? Uh, Senator Dunningham, I've called you for your second supplementary. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, President. Uh, refer to the minister's uh, characterisation in the negative of Aki in his last answer. Will the government put out a new risk fixing their calculations? Uh, Senator Dunningham, I've got the, uh, Senator Wong on her feet. I again, uh, point of order. That is commentary. If he wants to give a speech, he can do so later. Uh, you've got a plethora of people, but I'm going to take your uh, point of order, Senator Birmingham. Thank, thank, thank you, President. Uh, On sorry, the... Senator Birmingham, not until your side is quiet. You have your leader on his feet. President, Senator Birmingham. Order from the Leader of the Government in the Senate. It would make a mockery of the concept of supplementary questions if a senator were not able to commence a supplementary question by referring directly to what the minister had just uh, said you, in senator the preceding Birmingham. answer. Thank you, so Senator, senator Wong's point of order has thank no you. basis. Please President. resume your seat. Order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham. I will note it has been the custom in this place for senators from both sides or well, all over the parliament to make comments uh, leading into their first and second supplementary. So if we're going to call it to order, it's for order for everyone. Senator Dunningham, uh, second supplementary. Thank you for your ruling, uh, President. And, uh, Having made that point twice, will the government put out a new RIS fixing their calculations and referencing errors with the spiritual healer, or does the minister contend the RIS is right? Minister what? I'll tell you what's right about the RIS, and I'd like to read from the RIS, which Senator says Cash. the significant benefits of being covered by an enterprise agreement and the costs that may be associated with remaining covered by a modern award outweigh the additional cost for businesses to engage with the new multi-enterprise bargaining streams. You forgot Order. to read that bit of the RIS, didn't you? You forgot to read the bit that says that uh, businesses— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Um. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, Senator Dunningham also forgot to read the bit of the RIS that says that businesses are often covered by multiple modern awards, which can be complicated and difficult to interpret. An enterprise agreement enables an employer to have one industrial instrument which applies to a business which simplifies their workplace relations arrangements. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to have an industrial relations system which provides a simple Order. method for small businesses to participate uh, Watt, in an agreement that is negotiated? 
once again order. Uh, Minister Watt. This is question time. If you wish to make a contribution, uh, there are plenty of other times to make the contribution throughout the week. The question has been asked. I've called the minister to answer it, and I expect him to be heard in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. So it is interesting that the, the opposition chooses to cherry pick from the RIS, but leaves out all the bits that talk about the benefits to business, the benefits to workers, the benefits to the economy of pursuing this. And we make no apologies for uh, doing things to you, give Senator workers White, a pay rise and small business expired. simplicity. Uh, Senator Billett. Senator Billett. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Ahead of the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women on 25 November and the 16 days of activism that follow, can the minister update the Senate on the importance of addressing gender-based violence? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question and for raising this uh, matter today. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is an important day for us to acknowledge one of the widespread human rights abuses that exists worldwide. This day also commences the 16 days of activism. We mark this day as part of a global call to action to end violence against women. Worldwide, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. This is even higher when including sexual harassment. And this statistic is mirrored by the Australian experience, where one in three women have experienced violence by an intimate partner. One woman dies every 10 days in Australia at the hands of her former or current partner. And one in two women in Australia have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. First Nations women are 11 times more likely to be killed due to experiencing family violence than non-Indigenous women, and are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised as the result of this violence. We know that this violence is compounded for women from some backgrounds who also experience other forms of discrimination like ableism, homophobia and racism, and that it just doesn't have a human cost. It also costs the economy at $26 billion a year, half of which is borne by the victims themselves. This violence against women and children is not inevitable, and we can and must take action to end it. It's why we're working with states and territories on a collective goal to end violence against women and children in a generation through the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022 to 2032 that was released on the 17th of October this year and agreed by the Commonwealth states and territories. President, together we can take action to achieve an Australia and a world where all women and girls live free from fear and violence. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick. First supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. Can you outline what the Albanese government is doing to address gender-based violence for us? Minister. Thank you, President. Thanks, Senator Billick, for the supplementary. The government is already taking action to support the national plan. Through the national plan, $1.7 billion of investment through the recent budget to support initiatives under the national plan, including funding for consent and respectful relationships education and 500 frontline service and community workers to support women and children experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence. That was a policy designed and advocated for by my colleague, Senator McAllister, in the previous term of parliament. We've also intr introduced family, uh, paid family and domestic violence leave. We're implementing the recommendations, all of them from Respect at Work report, including legislating a positive duty on employers to provide workplaces free of harassment. We're investing $1.6 billion from the returns of the Housing Australia Future Fund, including to support women es escaping DV and, and older women at risk of homelessness. And we're also developing a standalone First Nations national plan for family safety Thank under the leadership Minister, of Minister Burney and Minister Rishworth. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you outline what role we all have to play in achieving an Australia free from gender-based violence? Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Billick. While we are proud to be investing record Commonwealth funding to end, end gender-based violence, we know we cannot end it and do it alone. The National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children provides a blueprint for our collective action and outlines the shared role we all have to play in ending violence against women. It's a joint initiative. Um, the National Plan also highlights that everyone must play a role in ending this violence across government, communities, workplace, sporting organisations, business and the media. 
If we all pull in the same direction, pull together, change is possible. Can I also just put on the record my uh, support and uh, respect for all of the advocates who have been working year after year, day after day, uh, to uh, end violence against women and children and to make sure that the issue of ending violence against women and children is never off the national agenda. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Minister, the tourism industry directly employed over 666,000 Australians in the June quarter of this year, many of them being small business operators. Under Labor's extreme IR changes, could a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula employing 20 staff be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula due to them being in the same industry and geographical location? Minister Farrell. Oh. Thank you. Senator Wong? Uh, just on a point of order, I, I have not intervened given the political contest here, and I understand it's an, a point of order. I'm making a point uh, of order. Senator Henderson, I've called She's Senator Wong on a point She's of order. Me. Resume your seat. Excuse me. Senator Henderson, I'm the president. I've called the Senator Wong to her feet. She's making the point of order. And you're interject interjecting, Senator Wong. Thank you. The, the point of order goes to whether the question is in order given the, where the bill is. Uh, I have not intervened to date because I understand that, you know, that the policy and politics of the issue is a matter that, uh, uh, that the Senate has historically and uh, continued to question, uh, even when legislation is before the Senate, notwithstanding that the uh, the standing orders. Uh, but I may have misheard Senator Henderson, but I, I thought she direct directly went to the legislation, in which case I would assert it is out of order in the current terms. And I, but, the, but the way I would deal with it, because I understand the issue, Senator Birmingham, is if that is the case, I would invite her to rephrase. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, just, uh, just before you rule on the point of order, uh, I do note that indeed on Tuesday of this week, yes. uh, the government themselves yes. asked a question related to this legislation. Uh, I further note uh, that, uh, that indeed you and previous presidents have ruled broadly in relation uh, to these questions about anticipation of Senate business uh, and would encourage you to uphold your and previous rulings about that breadth of questioning that is available to senators. Uh, I'll just take some advice, Senator Birmingham, because I thought the question was not confined to Senator Farrell's area, but I'll take advice. Uh, in relation to the point of order, I'm advised that um, if the question went generally to policy issues, then it would be uh, reasonable to ask Senator Farrell to answer it. But the, policy, but the question, in my view, did go to details because it sought a comparison uh, under an aspect of the proposed bill that uh, related one type of business to another type of business. So I can invite Senator Farrell to uh, answer the broad policy nature of that question. Uh, Senator, oh, sorry, Senator Henderson, I've got Senator Wong on her feet and then I'll come to you. Yeah, I, I was simply saying we would give leave to rephrase uh, rather than going to Senator Farrell if that is convenient to the opposition. Thank you. So the advice from Senator Wong is um, she is perfectly fine if you wish to rephrase the question. Um, rather than it go to Senator Farrell, because it does detail, with, it does uh, go to detail. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I thank you, Madam President. Um, Senator Farrell, how would these changes impact on a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula, employing 20 staff, um, compared with 
a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula with respect to multi-employer bargaining are uh, due to these two businesses being in the same industry and geographical location. And obviously, I'm asking specifically in relation to the tourism industry. Uh, I do believe, Senator, that is, <laughs> Senator Henderson, that is the same uh, question simply reframed, but I have Senator Wong on her feet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Pre President. I would contest that in terms of the way in which rulings on these matters have been held previously, it has been clear, as I said, and Hodges states, the rule concerning anticipation is not interpreted narrowly, because if it were, it would block questions on a wide variety of subjects. Indeed, none other than former Senator John Faulkner has argued previously about the broad interpretation taken in relation to this. Uh, the Senator's question relates to policies and reforms of the government. Uh, she's asking about those policies, reforms and changes. She has not referenced specific legislation either in her first go at the question nor in her rewording of the question. Senator Wong. Uh, in response to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, I think the difficulty here is that the Senator repeated precisely the words to which I responded, which is these changes. It's clearly the case that she is saying these changes, meaning the legislation which is before the chamber, uh, and as such I, I, I would submit, needs to be rephased to be compliant with uh, Standing Order 73. I am uh, going to rule. I will seek further advice uh, after question time, Senator Birmingham, but I think, uh, Senator Henderson, I'm speaking. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Henderson, I will come to you. Um, I think, as I gave my first answer, I think if it's around the broad policy, it's uh, at the invitation of Senator Farrell to answer, and I'll, I remain with that response, but I am happy to take further advice after question time. Senator Henderson, did you have a point of order? Uh, just, I was just asking uh, if I could be given an opportunity to rephrase in light yes, of your further that, clarification. Yes, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Senator Farrell, in light of the government's extreme IR policies, could a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula employing 20 staff be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula due to them being in the same industry and geographical location. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and I thank uh, uh, Senator Henderson for her question. <coughs> um, Look, I totally reject your uh, description of this legislation as extreme. Yeah. Uh, the Labor Party went to the last. The, La the Labor Party went to the last election saying Order. we were going to lift the wages uh, of Australians and, in particular, low-paid Australians, and that's what this legislation does. Yeah. Now, if I if I was a small business. Um, operating a cafe or, for that matter, a hotel in the, uh, in the Mornington Peninsula, I would be delighted with this legislation because I would know, I would know that for the first time in 10 years, for the first time in 10 years, low-paid workers will have an opportunity to lift their wages. We know, we know from, we know from what the former leader of the uh, government in the Senate said that low wages, no wages, was a designed feature of the Liberal Party's policy. A design, a designed feature of the Labor Party's policy Order. is uh, lifting Minister the wages. Barrel, please resume your seat, um, Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, a point of order on direct relevance. I was asking the minister uh, to answer the question in relation to the two, two businesses. businesses. Uh, could they be compelled into multi-employer yeah. multi bargaining? Thank you. So could the minister please Thank you. directly uh, address that? Senator Henderson, Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, on the point of order, uh, the uh, question actually put a hypothetical, uh, which also was not in order, but given the, um, what we'd already gone through to try and get to a question previously, I didn't take a point of order on that, but it would be unsurprising if the minister answers in slightly broader terms, given you put a hypothetical to it. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I'll remind Minister Farrell of the question, uh, and I note that he uh, started down that path. 
but uh, probably got distracted by the disorder that was in the chamber. But Minister Farrell, um, please well, direct President. yourself to the question. Now, if I was an operator in the tourism um, industry in the uh, Morning Peninsula, I'm regrettably not, but uh, it would be a lovely place to be uh, operating. Um, I, I, would, I, would be saying, I would be saying to all of our community, what's going to help tourism in my community? What's going to help tourism in my community? Uh, that's going to be more people coming out and coming into my cafe and coming into my hotel. Um, and Order. how is that going to occur? How Order. is that going to occur? That is by lifting the wages of all of the people in that community. And as we as we lift the wages of those, as we lift the wages, look, I know, Senator Cash, I know you don't accept these fundamental. Uh, thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, I take your answer to mean that these businesses could be compelled to bargain together, and I ask, under Labor's extreme IR policies. Could a local winery employing 20 staff on the Ballerine Peninsula be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a local pub in Port Arlington, Victoria, due to oh, being in the same you. industry and um, geographical Senator location? Senator Henderson, please resume your seat. Minister. Uh, point of order, uh, President. I understand. I remember there is a standing order which prevents hypothetical questions. Uh, these, both of these questions have been hypothetical questions. As in, would are, would are this or would are that are hypothetical oh, in order. nature. Order. I know the wage cutters over there don't like being held order. to standing orders. Uh, but, Senator Watt, you know. please resume your seat. Um, Minister Birmingham, on the same point of order. Same point of order, President. Australian businesses only wish that Labor's policies uh, were Senator hypothetical. That the is sad not a reality point of order. Resume, resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Uh, on a point of order, Senator Gallagher. Same point of order, um, President. I think if you look at Standing Order 73-1G uh, around rules for questions, it's very clear that questions that contain hypothetical matter should are not in order. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senators. Um, 73.1G does go to hypothetical, but the, the question that Senator Henderson asked was around policy, and I'm going to allow the question. Um, Senator Henderson, I'm not quite sure if you finished your question. I think you were midway and you got sat down. So if you can ask the question again, please. And I'm asked. Thank, thank you, Senator Ayres. I'm going to reset the clock. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Madam President. Um, as I say, I take, Minister, um, your answer to mean that these business, businesses could be compelled to bargain together. And I ask under Labor's extreme IR policies, uh, could a local winery employing 20 staff on the Ballerine Peninsula, where I live, be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a local pub in Port Arlington, Victoria, due to being in the same industry and geographical location. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, President, and I thank, uh, thank uh, uh, Senator Henderson for her uh, supplementary uh, question. And uh, I, I totally reject you putting words into my mouth. Um, I'm happy if you quote. I'm happy if you quote. I'm happy if you quote what I say. Senator Cash, um, Senator as, McGrath. As my answer, I reject. I reject the words that you're trying to put into my, into my mouth. I also fundamentally reject your suggestion that this uh, legislation is extreme. This is not extreme legislation. This is legislation. Legislation. We we told the Australian people at the last election. And that includes all of uh, the Senator tourism Farrell, operators. Senator please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Henderson. Point of order on direct relevance. I asked the minister um, in relation to the compulsion between two businesses, uh, whether they are compelled to engage in multi-employer bargaining. Could the minister address the uh, question, Senator please? Henderson, you also had a political statement at the front of that, uh, before that question, and I do believe that the minister is being uh, relevant. Thank you, Minister. Please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, uh, look, look, 
for, for a government, when you're in government, you totally let down the tourism industry right. in this country. Right. For you now, for you now to be saying, Thank you, Minister for you Farrell, now, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, second supplement order. Second supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Minister, after two years of COVID impacting Australia's tourism industry, when the former coalition government did so much for the tourism industry, an industry now suffering labour shortages, why is the Labor government bringing in extreme IR laws, which employers, including tourism operators in Victoria, have said will make it harder Order. for them to employ people? Thank you, Senator Henderson. And Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Henderson, for your uh, second supplementary uh, question. Are you kidding? Are you, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? What, what your government, what your government did? Uh, Minister Farrell. Order, 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 order. I have a senator on her feet. Thank Minister Watt. Senator Henderson. Oh, Madam President, I'm not kidding. I'm very serious, but I would ask As that what? the minister direct the, his comments through you the chair. You have a point of order. Thank yes, you. thank you. I remind the um, minister of the question. Order, minister, please answer the question. President, <coughs> thank you. Order. It's all about Sarah. Senator Watt. Thank Mr. you, Farrell. thank you, President, and I will direct my comments uh, to the chair. But I will also direct them to all of those people over there who totally let down the tourism industry in this country. We're finally, we're finally starting the rebuild of the tourism industry. Whether it's a cafe on the Bellarine Peninsula, a hotel on the Bellarine Peninsula, we're lifting their wages and we're starting the rebuild. You left this industry for dead. You cut JobKeeper when you should have kept it going. You kicked out. You kicked out. Yep, Minister yep. Farrell. Yes, you were giving it to all your big mates. Order. Thank you. Were, you you were giving Farrell. it to your mates when Minister you should have Farrell, been giving resume it. Resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to Senator McAllister, representing the Environment Minister. In recent weeks, Australians were shocked and bloody angry when news broke. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, Senator McAllister is an Assistant Minister. Do you wish to redirect? Assistant Ministers don't take questions. I'm happy to go to Senator Pratt and just, come back to you if you want. Or no, no, you're, uh, you're right. I'll, I'll just make it my, more broad. My question is to the senator representing the Environment Minister. Well, Senator Wish Wilson, I don't know who that is, so you well, need to well, be direct. Well I, well, I don't either, actually. Given, given Senator Farrell was on a, uh, a rare moment of uh, a role, an animation, I might direct Order. it to him. Order. I actually don't know, President. Order. Uh, Oh, Senator Wong. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Senator Wong, in, in, in recent weeks, Australians were shocked and bloody angry when news broke that the soft plastics recovery scheme run by Red Cycle had collapsed, with billions of tonnes of plastic packaging being stored in warehouses rather than being recycled. Australians who were doing the right thing taking plastic packaging back to supermarkets where it was purchased, rightly had expectations that big business and government would live up to their end of the bargain and see these plastics, which are so commonly found and dangerous in our oceans, recycled. Uh, Minister Plibersek herself expressed frustration at the news, saying it shouldn't be beyond big companies like Coles and Woolworths to come up with a viable solution to soft plastic recycling. Senator, why is it seemingly beyond these big business companies to do this, to sort out their mess, and what is your government now planning to do to hold them to account? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, um, President, and thank you, thank you for the question. And I acknowledge there's uh, quite a lot of representing ministers here, so I understand the, the mistake that was made. Um, uh, can I just say first, uh, we, we share uh, your and many Austra the frustration of many Australians with 
uh, what has occurred uh, in the soft plastics recycling sector. Uh, I know personally in our household and in many households people who did the right thing uh, and made sure that they put their soft plastics together in a big bag and took them down to the local uh, supermarket uh, in the hope that you know we might actually reduce the amount of soft plastics in the environment. Uh, we're very, very disappointed uh, by the news that uh, the, the, uh, you know, the it was it was you know the, the the financial position the industry was in, but also the the lack of results. Um, I was asked a question about why is it beyond big business. Well, I, I, I guess you'd have to ask them. Uh, what I can say is uh, it's clear that the regulatory settings. Uh, that were in place and the incentives which, which were in place, uh, whether they are government or market driven, were insufficient for that sector to work. Uh, we know uh, that there, there is uh, not just environmental but economic benefit uh, in recycling as opposed to landfill. Uh, and, I, and knowing uh, Ms Plibersek as I do and her determination uh, as environment minister to take action on this, I've no doubt she will look very carefully at what is the best way forward. Uh, uh, this is an issue where I would say to the um, industry that these Australians are clear in terms of their behaviours, uh, what, what they want to do, uh, and uh, it would be uh, a good thing if the market could respond to the, uh, that incentive, which is people want to do the right thing. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Wishwilson, first supplementary. Uh, the Environment Department has said multiple times in estimates it will likely know by the end of this year whether Australia will meet our 2025 packaging waste reduction and recycling targets facilitated by the big business-led uh, Australian Packaging Covenant. Well, it's the end of the year, Minister, and this is a significant matter of public interest, as you just uh, mentioned. Can the government now provide to the Senate and to the Australian people an update on whether we will meet our 2025 packaging targets? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wong. Uh, well, first, uh, the, the um, Senator um, you know, was critical of the targets. Um, what I understand is we're a long way from, me, even, from meeting them. Uh, the, the note I have in front of me, and I'll confirm this, is that the target of 70 per cent of plastic packaging uh, was set for 2025, and Australia's been stuck at 16 per cent for four years. Now, I don't know if that's going to be worsened by the subsequent industry uh, you know, collapse or challenges that you've described. Uh, clearly, uh, nine years of a coalition government who didn't want to do anything on this uh, uh, has, has meant we're a long way behind. Well, you can, Senator Henderson, I'd like you to explain to us then why, if you set a target for 70 per cent and announced it, why we're still stuck at 16 per cent. I think I mean, the, the problem with the, the coalition is they, they seem to think if you announce something, it magically happens. Well, transitions and, and policy take a bit more work than that. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, second supplementary. Uh, thanks, uh, Senator. It sounds like yet another failed plastic waste reduction and recycling scheme based on what you've said. Um, so I suppose my question is in what is it going to take for your government to accept that after 25 years of repeated failures to reduce plastic packaging waste, uh, that a voluntary approach that relies on the goodwill of big business to do the right thing doesn't work and that you actually need to now regulate the package industry and give actual consequences for failure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Well, Minister Senator Wong. Wish Wilson, I come from the state of South Australia and you might remember the arguments over, I think it was called container deposit legislation, and we ended up going it alone because, uh, and, and frankly, it, it, it proved to be the right uh, response. Uh, if I could just go through what I understand that, that we have done in the six months we've been in office. Uh, there's a, a six, $250 million investment in infrastructure to sort, process and remanufacture materials, including $60 million in the recent budget for hard-to-recycle plastics such, such as soft plastics. The minister has added plastics from medical waste, mattress and tyres to the minister's priorities list. L listing these products is a signal to industry signal to industry to act, and if not, then obviously government can. In October, Minister Plibersek led the Environment Minister's agreement to reform the regulation of packaging by 2025. Now, obviously there is more work to do, uh, but we, we understand how important this is, not just for the environment, but actually for Australians. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing and Homelessness, Senator Farrell. Can the minister explain how regional Australia is benefiting from the Albanese government's housing agenda? 
Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pratt for her question. Um, it's a very important question, and it's uh, pleasing to see some sensible policy questions being asked here today. Um, and we know, we know that far too many Australians are struggling to buy a home, and that Australians living in regional areas have faced some of the largest drops in housing affordability making it increasingly hard for locals uh, to save a sufficient deposit. After almost a decade of inaction, the Albanese government is finally showing national leadership to help get more regional Australians into their first home. The Albanese government acted to deliver on our commitment to establish the regional first home buyers guarantee um, in, uh, by October three months earlier than, uh, than promised. 10,000 places will be available each financial year through the Regional uh, First Home Buyer Guarantee to support regional first home buyers to purchasing new or existing homes uh, with a deposit of as little as 5%. To be eligible, uh, the regional, to, for the uh, regional uh, first home buyer guarantee, applicants must be Australian citizens, uh, must purchase outside a capital city uh, and must demonstrate that they have been living in the region in which they are purchasing the property for at least uh, 12 months. The regional guarantee is part of the uh, Albanese government's ambitious housing reform agenda, Madam uh, President to support people into home ownership and improve the supply and the quality of social and affordable housing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. Can the minister provide an update on the number of Australians who have accessed the regional first home buyer guarantee to date? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. <coughs> thank you, um, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Pratt for her genuine interest uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. Um, the Albanese government has, of course, hit the ground running on housing and is delivering immediate action with the regional first home buyers guarantee. Since being launched early uh, on the 1st of October this year, over 1,000 regional Australians have been assisted into, yes, 1,000 have been assisted into home ownership um, by, this, uh, by this guarantee. I recently saw the story of Abby and Corin and their baby McKinnon, who live in Townsville. Um, and uh, they, of course, uh, had the opportunity to uh, access uh, this, uh, this project or this program uh, and uh, now expect that uh, by Christmas, uh, they will be uh, moving into their you, uh, new Senator home. Time has expired. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister explain how this program supports the Albanese government's broader housing agenda? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can uh, explain uh, that uh, question to you. A very sensible question. Uh, alongside the regional first home buyer guarantee, the Albanese government will deliver the National Housing Accord. We'll deliver the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. We've unlocked $575 million in funding from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility. The, housing, the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council will provide independent advice uh, to the government, uh, we will have a national housing and homelessness plan uh, and we will implement the help to buy scheme. All of our housing policies are targeted to ensure more Australians have a safe place to call home, including regional Thank first you, home Senator buyer Farrell, guarantee. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Uh, the government has budgeted national urgent care clinics with three promises to be established in Tasmania. Is the government going to honour that promise? 
uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for a question and her interest in um, health and health services in Tasmania. Um, the urgent care clinics are a new model of care that we committed to in the election, and Senator Tyrrell is correct to say that there were three um, committed to um, in locations in Tasmania as part of that campaign, and the commitments were in Burnie, Launceston and Hobart. I understand the Premier of Tasmania has requested that the Burnie clinic be in Davenport or the Latrobe region, which was agreed to as well. So I think, um, yes, the, the very short answer to your question is yes, they will be delivered. Um, we are working with states and territories on uh, finalising the model. Uh, and we'll go through that work, but the money was provided in the budget to deliver on the commitment we made, which was 50 urgent care clinics. Subsequent to making that commitment, New South Wales and Victoria have uh, supplemented um, and provided funding, I think, in the order of $100 million um, for um, clinics in their states, and so we've added in some money on top of the uh, original commitment to work with them to get the model right. But it is an exciting model. Um, I know that um, here in the ACT it's a different model, uh, but we had um, walk, nurse led walk in centres which provided a bit of the gap between emergency departments and out of hours care, particularly for those uh, not needing to head to the hospital. They've been very, very popular with the local community here, and we think that model can be built upon, but with obviously with general practice as key participants. Um, so we will deliver it. We're working with states and territories to refine the model, um, and of course, working with general practice across the country as well uh, to make sure it aligns uh, with their priorities as well. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Given the serious shortages of GPs and nursing staff in Tasmania, um, how are we going to ensure that these three clinics will be fully staffed and resourced? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, yes, so working with the, um, the relevant state is a really important part of that, so on workforce more broadly in the area of healthcare, which is why I think um, the what, what works in New South Wales and Victoria will assist in the rollout of the clinics nationally as well and how that can uh, complement state workforce with um, and what they're doing with what primary care needs. But you're right, it, it on itself, it, urgent care clinics on their own are not going to solve some of the issues because of the issues um, in remote and rural parts of the country. And that's why it has to be part of the other commitments we've made, which is you know, like the um, investment in strengthening Medicare fund, which we've got the task force in place, um, working with primary care, essentially rebuilding primary care, which is under so much strain, looking at the role delineation within primary care, so nurse practitioners and the work they do, and the announcement around uh, meeting the hex debts for um, for health practitioners Thank to work minister, in the region is also has part expired. of it. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. All right, serious question now. When? When are we going to get them? Minister. Uh, so we've we've committed to them over the uh, first term. In fact, don't, we've profiled the money in this financial year. Uh, so the intention is to get them up and running as soon as possible, um, um, working with uh, the jurisdictions and with primary care. Um, it, it might be that there's different starts in different jurisdictions as, it, as they get rolled out, but the, we, we completely understand that this support needs to flow, um, but it's not something the federal government can do on its own. So the money's there. It's profiled in that first year. We're going to work in partnership um, with those jurisdictions that want to, um, and those obviously those other investments, um, like the one to support um, staff, um, that I talked about starting January this year, the Strengthening Medicare Task Force is in place and the grants going to um, GPs, the $220 million worth of grants to help them accommodate the, their workload is also uh, funded in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. The Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office says the suburban rail loop would cost $36.5 billion for Stage 1 and $125 billion for the full project. At Senate estimates on 28 October, infrastructure department officials gave evidence the funding available for the suburban rail loop included, and I quote, $11 billion from the state, $11 billion through some kind of value capture, and $2.2 billion from the Commonwealth. 
announced funding adds up to only $25 billion. Order. In the Australian Financial Review today, Premier Andrews is quoted saying the suburban rail loop is fully funded and underway. Minister, what advice, other than the Australian Financial Review, has the Victorian government provided that the suburban rail loop is fully funded? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Wong? Just a point of order on uh, this. I can't remember which. Well, I don't think that that's a point of order, Senator Harris, but uh, I don't. I, I might have misheard, uh, but it seemed to me the question does not go to a, a ministerial portfolio. A question about the set the state government's sources of advice and how the state government came to a position is not a matter for a Commonwealth minister. Um, Senator Birmingham, on the point of order. Pre President, on the uh, on the point of order, order. Senator Van directly quoted evidence from departmental officials at Senate estimates. The question goes to assurances given to the Commonwealth. This is a government that has decided to give $2.3 billion, um, billion dollars to the, a project. What's it's the perfectly point of reasonable order? to ask with this project whether in giving that budget commitment they're aware if it's fully funded or not. Uh, thank you. Order. Senator Wong, on the, is it on the same point of order? Order. Order. It just needs to be rephrased. You can't ask a Order. Thank you. I'm going to respond to the points of order. Senator Watt can answer that question to the extent that it covers his Commonwealth responsibilities, bearing in mind that the question referenced uh, the Victorian Budget Office and the AFR. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, and yes, we, we do mo maybe need Senator Smith to run his eye over some of those questions to make sure they comply with standing orders. Something that we know he takes very seriously. Um, the suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project, and we're doing something that the former government never chose to do, which is to honour election commitments. Remember that funny old tradition of honouring your Senator election McKenzie. commitments? I know that it didn't happen under you, Bob, but we actually take these things seriously. We went to the people with uh, an election Senator, commitment uh, to spend— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. I'm asking those, particularly on my left, to listen to the answer in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator President. Ayers. The, uh, we went to the election with a very clear commitment to spend $2.2 billion towards early works for the suburban rail loop east. Uh, and that was on the back of the fact that the Victorian government had prepared a detailed business and investment case for the suburban rail loop, uh, which was released last uh, year Senator and McGrath. demonstrated a cost-benefit ratio of up to 1.7, um, meaning a dollar— please resume your seat. Um, Senator McKenzie. A uh, point of order on relevance. Senator Watt is simply reading out the talking points that he's read out uh, all Senator week. McKenzie, that is the not a point of order. Relevant. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Right, well, let's just get straight to the point of order. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. On relevance, the question went to quoting Senate estimates evidence at our Rural and Regional Affairs Transport Committee where departmental officials listed how much the government has actually put on the table in their budget for this project, which is directly uh, you, contradicted McKenzie. by the Premier thank you. of Victoria. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. The question went to the rail project and estimates, and the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, President. Now, I know that the opposition chooses to ignore this, but repeatedly we have made the point that the business case provided by the Victorian government demonstrates a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7, which means that $1.70 would be returned for every $1 investment. Now, it's interesting that the opposition is so hung up uh, on projects and, and involvement with state governments and things like that, because it wasn't that long ago that the former Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, someone I know they all choose to forget and don't pretend was never a member, member of their party, he announced that the Commonwealth would commit $5 billion to the Melbourne Airport Rail Link project without even speaking to the Victorian Premier first. Uh, and in March this year, the 
In March this year, the Coalition announced a $1.6 billion commitment for the direct rail line from Brisbane to the Sunshine Coast, which Order. the Queensland Government described as Order. a bit of a surprise, and the money appeared pl plucked out of the sky. So again, if we're seriously going to be relying on the Liberal and National Order. Party to lecture people about appropriate Senator spending McGrath. of public money, then we're going to be having to wait a fair while for that. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Van, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, has the Victorian government provided any evidence or assurance to the Albanese government that the, de that the Premier Andrews' controversial suburban rail loop is fully funded? Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. I have every confidence in the Victorian government's uh, commitment to build. That's five uh, seconds. Senator, what? Please resume your seat. Uh, when there's order on my left, I have a senator on his feet. When when there is order on my left, Senator Van. Point of order on relevance. We. I didn't ask about your assurances. I asked about evidence. Uh, thank you, Senator Van. The, uh, with respect, the minister was about five seconds into his answer, so we'll listen. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Thank you, President. And things have got pretty grave in the Victorian campaign uh, when Senator Van is the person who's being turned to to rescue the Liberal Party in Victoria. Uh, as I say, I have every confidence uh, that the Victorian government um, will. Oh, I know. here we go. Senator Watt. <laughs> Order. 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 Order on my left and right. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Henderson. Madam President, um, that was a really inappropriate reflection on the senator in this place, and I would ask the member to withdraw that comment. Uh, if it, I don't believe it was a personal reflection, but if it assists the Senate, I'm sure Senator Watt will withdraw. Thank you, Senator Watt. I withdraw. Senator Scar. Because I do. <laughs> Look, I know it's hard to hear facts. I know it's hard to hear about governments that actually do things by the book. I, ha I know it's hard to hear about governments that invest uh, based on Watt. business cases. Uh, look Senator at all that. Remember those business cases that didn't exist? Uh, Senator Watt, that's what, please that's resume what the your seat. Senator Watt. Uh, Senator McGrath, your incessant interjections are incredibly disorderly. And Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. So, as I say, there's a business case that's provided by the Liberal Party and the National uh, Party, Senator and Watt. I don't think it can be a prop because it's a blank piece of paper. I'm not sure that that constitutes a prop, because that's the extent of the business cases that we used to see from the Liberal and the National Party when it came to investing in projects. In contrast, the Victorian government has put forward a business case which demonstrates this is a good project, uh, and uh, we have every intention of getting behind it. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Stirl. Oh, sorry, Senator Van. It's been so long since you've been on your feet. Second supplementary. <laughs> I was on my feet yesterday. So long. Minister, if the Victorian Premier is saying the suburban rail loop project is fully funded, can the minister advise the Senate on how much each government is contributing and will the government provide a commitment that no additional Commonwealth dollars will be provided to the project? Minister what? Well, Senator Van knows full well, and I have already said that Senator what our McGrath. government has committed is $2.2 billion towards this project. Uh, we, we, know, we know that the Victorian government has committed funding of its own. We know that this is a project that will take some time to complete. And you know why it will take Senator some time McKenzie. to complete? It's because the former government didn't want to invest in public transport infrastructure. So now we're getting on with the job of actually investing this. Uh, it will take till 2035 to complete the project, and that will require Senator, uh, future uh, budget, Senator, budget Minister decisions. Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, I'm asking you to listen quietly, particularly senators on my left. Minister Watt, please resume. Senator McKenzie, I've just asked for quiet, and you immediately interject again. Minister Watt. <laughs> Minister Watt, please continue. 
Thank you, President. As I say, we know that for 10 years we had a government in Canberra that didn't want to invest in public transport infrastructure. That has changed. We now have an Albanese Labor government that is prepared to get behind big infrastructure projects that will help with public Senator transport con and relieving congestion. Senator McGrath. Minister, please. Oh, Senator Searle on a point of order. If you're still going, President, I'll wait. I'll wait. Minister Watt. The, uh, the, so, as I say, we're, we're getting behind public transport infrastructure in Melbourne. Remember, it was the last government that pulled out the funding for Cross River Rail in Brisbane as well. They didn't want to see public transport infrastructure there. You were the finance minister. Uh, you minister could have got Watt. behind this and you minister didn't do Watt. it. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Order. Um, I'm misleading the Senate. The Albanese government didn't even fund uh, the Great Senator, Ocean Road. Senator Henderson. When they were last in government. As I explained yesterday, there are many opportunities throughout the week in the Senate to debate points. That's a debating point. Please resume your seat. Minister Watt. I'll talk to you. Sorry. Have you, Minister Watt? Um, so, it must hurt the, Victoria, the, the opposition, especially those Victorians who have fought in tooth and nail against Senator this project. McGrath, but we're going to get this project done because we want to relieve congestion in Melbourne, just like we want to relieve it in Brisbane and Sydney and Thank in you, even Minister provincial Watt. cities, Minister Senator Watt, McKenzie. Your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Stirl. OK. Thank you, President. Yep. My question Order. is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The Albanese government has committed to getting wages moving with its workplace relations policies, which will provide Australians with job security, gender equity and sustainable wage growth, after a decade of neglect by the Liberals and Nationals. Can the Minister please outline the benefits of these policies to both Australian workers and businesses? Why is it important to get wages moving? Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl. Another one of our uh, comrades over here who has spent a lot of time working uh, for, for working people right across the country. And we are unapologetic for standing up for working people in this country. Uh, I was hoping Watt. that we'd end the week uh, on, a, on, a, on a question from the government about our industrial relations reforms. Minister Watt. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. I would ask those again on my left to Stop with the shouting out. It is not a football match. It is question time. You are all being incredibly disorderly. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I say, I'm very happy that we're ending the week of question time speaking about the government's important industrial relations policies, uh, which are all about driving, helping people get a decent pay rise. Because if there's one thing that drives this uh, government, it's our ambition to deliver a decent pay rise for working Australians. And there are some pretty simple reasons why that is. Not just because Australian Senator workers both McGrath. need and deserve a pay rise, but also because good sustainable wage growth is good for our economy. Our policies provide workers on lower middle incomes facing the pressure of inflation and interest rates with a way to also get pay rises. And the best way to do this is by encouraging more agreements to be made and stop a race to the bottom on wages. But Australia's bargaining system has not worked effectively for a very long time. In fact, I would say for about 10 years. Only 15 per cent of employees are covered by an interim agreement. And we want to make more agreements that benefit both employers and workers rather than continue the conflict that we've seen over the last 10 years. Agreements allow trade-offs and provide a more simple and tailored set of conditions than the award, which benefits small Senator business. McGrath. To give one example of how this benefits small business, Jane has been an early childhood educator for 40 years. She's now the director of an early childhood education centre in Melbourne. She is incredibly passionate about her job, but it's been a tough industry to dedicate her life to. As the director of her centre, she's faced constant struggles with staffing shortages due to low wages and conditions in the sector. Jane and her sector, along with workers in 70 other sectors in Victoria, now benefit from being part of a multi-employer agreement. And not only have they won wage wages up to 18 per cent above the award, Thank they've you, also Senator won more White, things like planning for professional development. Senator Stirl, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline how some of the commentary around the government's workplace relations policies is just plain wrong? Minister Watt. 
Mr. Earl, and I'd love nothing more than to point out how some of the commentary about our policies are just plain wrong. For, ten, for nearly 10 years, wages were kept low as a deliberate design feature of the previous government's management of the economy, and the scare campaigns being run now by those with vested interests are good media fodder but are completely unfounded. Let's fact-check some of the claims that have been made over the last couple of weeks by the Coalition and some of their supporters. They, first of all, they say there will be coast-to-coast -coast strikes, ignoring the fact that nothing in relation to the system for industrial action at all changes compared to the system that was under the former government, except for the fact there will now be a requirement for conciliation first, an additional requirement before Order. industrial action occurs. There are claims made, being made that we'll see patent bargaining again. There's no changes compared to the legislation that existed under the former government. There's claims that businesses will be roped into industry-wide agreements. Plain wrong, and Senator Brockman got schooled on that yesterday. The fact is that an employer can choose to be part of multi-employer bargaining. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, President. Can the minister outline to the chamber the safeguards and benefits of the government's policies for small and medium-sized businesses? Uh, Minister Watt. I would love to do that, Senator Stirling. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to the Chamber about that. The Albanese Labor government's reforms and policies make bargaining more accessible for small and medium-sized businesses. It has been designed specifically to support those who are new to enterprise bargaining or are less equipped to navigate it. Small businesses often don't have the benefit of an HR department and can often be shut out of the benefits of enterprise bargaining that many medium and larger-sized businesses enjoy. For those small businesses Order. who do wish to bargain together, the cooperative bargaining stream is an attractive option as it's voluntary and they can opt into the stream at any time. And isn't it ironic that the party of choice and individual choice over there doesn't want to give Senator small McGrath. businesses the choice to opt in to cooperative bargaining? They're all for choice except Minister when it gives Watt, small businesses the choice. Senator McGrath, exercise some self-control, please, along with Senator Henderson. Minister Watt. Uh, and even when a small business uh, has employees who do want to have multi-employer bargaining, before that can occur it needs a majority of employees to agree. It needs the Fair Work Commission to find that there are common interests amongst Thank those you, employers. Minister this Watt, is good for workers and it's good for Minister Watt. Thank you. I ask further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of answers given during question time. Uh, I look around and I see an Australia that's getting smarter and smarter, an Australia that's getting tired of getting talked down to and control. And why is this? Union membership is hitting an all-time low, according, according to ABS statistics. Just 14 per cent of employees were trade union members, and we're well down on the 40 per cent of employees who were trade union members back in the 1990s. And although those opposite want to take our industrial relation laws back to the Hawke-Keating years, we do not live in the Hawke-Keating years, Senator Ayres. Despite this, the Labor Party is intent on pursuing an industrial relations policy that lives in a fantasy land where everyone's beholden to a union. And that's what opposite want. They want to take Australia backwards. And don't get me wrong, we on this side of the chamber want to change, want, want change to Australia's industrial relations system. To quote the Leader of the Opposition in Parliament, we all have a genuine desire to improve our industrial relations system. What we don't want is the system of control that those opposite want a system that wants to control workers, to control where they can work, control what they can earn, control their lives inside and outside the workplace. The industrial relations legislation that the Labor government has been trying to pass is some of the most radical in decades. If this government gets what it wants, or should I say what the union masters want, small business and the economy will suffer. Like most legislation from the Labor Party, it's small business that gets it hit hardest because under Labor governments, small businesses are on their own. One of the most dangerous parts of Labor's new industrial relations bill 
is the prospect of multi-employer bargaining. If it goes ahead, small business will face the bargaining costs of $14,638. And don't take my word for it. This is according to the department's regulatory impact statement to the bill. Medium businesses would face costs of $75,148 and large businesses $94,311. Unlike Labor and their union hacks, who have never run a business in their life, I've actually run a business and businesses know that they're hurting under this government. Didn't you come from a union, <laughs> Senator Still? While businesses are, stealing, are dealing with the Labor Party's 56 increase in power prices, those opposite might think that businesses have a spare four, 14 grand lying around. Well, wake up, they don't. Labor's proposed changes will move Australia's industrial relations system from bargaining done at enterprise level, also known as bargaining with the businesses where you work, to bargaining done across multiple workplaces and potentially across a whole industry. This would massively expand the power of trade unions, allowing them to operate in businesses they currently have no connection to. This includes tens of thousands of small businesses right across Australia. Under Labor's legislation, multiple sectors will be able to engage in crippling economy-wide strikes because unless those opposite realise, enterprise-wide bargaining will mean industry-wide strikes and the breakdown of the Australian economy. Don't you worry, if Labor's party, no, don't you, don't you worry, Senator Ayres, it's my time to be on my feet, so you can be quiet. If the Labor Party gets its way, the union thugs that don't protect will be breaking down the doors to small businesses and telling them what to do, because that's what Labor Party is all about, command and control. The attitude that we know how to run your life and run your business better than you do. Well, guess what? You don't. To conclude, Labor's dangerous industrial relations changes will mean more strikes, fewer jobs, giving unions unprecedented access to small businesses, which will lead to the death of hundreds of those small businesses. Senator Storm. You know, there's a saying there's only one van comes along in your lifetime, but I, I have to say, seriously, Senator Van, you want to have a real good look, look at yourself, get a grip. When you start accusing us on this side of ever running businesses and being union thugs and union hacks, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, Senator Van, for your information. When I grew up in working class, the son of a truck driver, I'm now the father of a truck driver and I was a long distance truck driver myself. And nothing irks me more when uh, ill informed ignoramuses make stupid statements like this. Don't leave, Senator Van, don't leave. I oh, please order, keep, give me an Van. opportunity. Yes. Uh, I believe that was a reflection on me, and I also noted another one from Senator Ayres earlier, and I asked that both senators withdraw them. Is this another point of order? Well, I've, 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 let me deal with the first point of order. Well, he doesn't. This is not a debate, Sen Sen Senator Henderson. Uh, Senator Van, who is the second senator that you've taken issue with? Uh, uh, Senator Ayres. I didn't hear what Senator Ayres. Senator Ayres, do you wish to withdraw to the extent that... De 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 Deputy President, uh, if there's so much sensitivity over don't, there... Don't, if, don't if debate it. Either withdraw, withdraw it. Either I'm very happy to withdraw. I'm, I'm very happy right, to I withdraw. want to get back to... Thank you. I'll take the withdrawal. Senator Stirl. I think Senator Stirl was referring generally to Liberals, but I'd ask him just to the extent that it may have inferred directly to Senator Van, I'd ask him to graciously withdraw. Deputy President, if assist in your running of the chamber, I'm more than happy to assist you, you, but I will not resolve from the fact no, I've been accused of withdrawal. Just I have proceed. withdrawn, but I will not resolve from the fact that I take umbrage as he walks out the chamber, you weak link, I tell you. Yeah, to Senator, have a crack at Senator me as a union Senator thug Senator and a union, a union school. You shouldn't, re you shouldn't reflect on wh whether a member is leaving the chamber or not. I'd ask you to withdraw that to the extent and then proceed with your, your contribution. Thank, thank, thank you. Se Senator Van, that was inappropriate as well. You go back to your chair and withdraw that. I happily withdraw, Deputy President. Right. Okay. Now, we're all ready to go. Senator Stirl. Please Deputy, proceed. 
All good, Deputy President. Thank you very much. But I just want to stress this, Deputy President, through Don't you. Don't disappoint me. Just go with it. No, no. All cool. I'm all cool. I'm having a ball. Deputy President, I actually ran my own business. And this is what irks me through you, Deputy President, when I hear ideology and I hear ridiculous statements from people who have no idea who the background of others in this chamber. I, for one, can talk with authority. I actually left school early. I actually ran my own business. My wife and I put our necks on the line with one month's payment and a house to hock everything we had to buy our first truck. Six trucks later, and I'm proud as punch that we did that. I couldn't have done it without my wife. I couldn't have done it without the drive that I had. And to be accused of not knowing business really gets up my nose. So what we can see, and we can clearly see here, Senator the Van had, had, in the opening statement, came out, this is all about ideology. This has got nothing to do with providing an opportunity for lower paid workers to get a decent pay pack and to, get to negotiate decent contracts. This is what really, really annoys me. And quite clearly, when I speak of this from authority, when we look at the likes of the bedwetters and the ones who are running around this country screaming out the last thing that we should be doing is going and pushing to change industrial relations laws so those that can't bargain collectively can actually have a chance to increase the opportunity to, to increase their pay packet and their working conditions. And who is this charge led by? Mr Deputy President, it is the usual suspects. Aki. Oh, I'd, I'd be so sad if Aki was missing because I think something's gone wrong. They've actually got some brains in that outfit. Business Council of Australia. Uh, AMA, AMA, and if AMA didn't start the fight, there's something really going. Guess who started the fight? AMA. And guess who else bought into it? None less than Mr Alan Joyce and Qantas. Now, Senator Sheldon, you've got a massive pair of shoes to fill and I can't fill them when you're talking about how bad an employer Qantas has come under Mr Joyce's tenure. But I'll give it a good shot. Here we have a man that went out there He's got his footprints etched in the blue carpet in this joint, running to the previous government's ministers, seeking support to give, us, to give him money to give to his employers. Work, uh, what was, oh, did he say work choices? I'm having a real nightmare today. Uh, a, job, a job keeper. Nearly a billion dollars. And what did it deliver? i tell you what it delivered. It kept Alan jo Mr Alan Joyce and Qantas and ably backed up by Mr Richard Goyer AO with his $560,000 sitting fee as the chairman and God knows whatever else, to go out in the middle of the night and sack nearly 2,000 baggage handlers. And then I read in the paper today, not only the fine comments from my colleague and my mate over here to my right, Senator Sheldon, that they have to upgrade their profit margin now. We've only been out of COVID, what, eight, seven or eight months or something, but they made a mistake. It's not, they have to up it by another 150 million. While Qantas is gouging the travellers of this nation, they're now saying that they're, going to, they're back in the red, anywhere between 1.4 and 1.5 billion dollars. Now, I say to everyone in Australia, who thinks that Mr Alan Joyce has ran a magnificent business since he's been in charge? And I can tell you now, and I look at my colleagues around this chamber from all sides, we spend more time on his plans than anyone. And I have no problem. I had no problem for many, many years as a Transport Workers' Union organiser after I sold my truck, after doing two years non-stop at Darwin with two babies at home that I never got to see. I missed my daughter's first walking and talking. And I wasn't going to miss it with my six-year-old son to come off the road because the TWU gave me an opportunity because guess what? I actually know things about trucks and I actually can put two words together and I can actually talk to employers and I can actually talk to employees and I want nothing better when employers and employees can work together to deliver magnificent outcomes for both. Because without a successful business, you don't have the opportunity to have a successful wage for your employees, who I was so proud to join up into my union and join me so we could collectively bargain. And I have the greatest respect. I have absolutely no respect for Alan Joyce. And if you fly in this nation and you haven't been gouged, you haven't lost your baggage, you haven't been lied to while you're sitting on the tarmac, and then they're blaming baggage handlers, which I copped this morning, there wasn't even baggage being put on, this is what really irks me. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of comments today by both Ministers Watt and Farrell. Well, it is very, very clear, colleagues, uh, that the old saying is true, leopards do not change their spots. It has taken very little time, in fact, less than six months, 
for it to become crystal clear to the Australian public why Labor was in opposition for nearly a decade. It is so clear they have not yet learnt. And just as they have done before in government, they are taking our workplace relations system and our economy backwards at both at the same time. They simply cannot be trusted, not only on their words, but on their ability to manage our nation through challenging times. So what have we already seen in less than six months under a Labor government? We have an economy with high inflation, we have high interest rates, we've got a rising cost of living, and Labor has had to admit that electricity prices under their policies will go up 56 per cent and gas 44 per cent, all putting together unsustainable cost of living pressures on everyday Australians. They talk a lot about solutions, but they have done absolutely nothing this year in a policy sense to change any of that. And now the Albanese government's reckless attempts to change industrial relations laws will hit every single sector of our economy, and in particular on every single small business in our nation who are the absolute backbone of our economy. And they are going to be hit the hardest, and shame on Labor for that. So, the cost of bargaining under the Albanese government's radical shake-up of the industrial relations system was revealed at just under $15,000 for a small business and $75,000 for a medium business. How on earth is any small business going to find another $15,000 just to comply with what they are imposing on them? They, most of them will no doubt not be able to afford it. So let's have a look at the impact of this on my own home state of Western Australia. Well, the West Australian has reported that small businesses across WA could, if not will, be pushed to the brink if Labor's one-size-fits-all industrial relations omnibus bill is rammed through the federal parliament this and next week. And that is very, very clear. So now what does our own Premier the Premier of Western Australia, a Labor Premier, say about this. Is he backing small businesses? Is he backing West Australian families? Is he backing employers who are already doing it tough? Nope. Of course he is not backing any one of those groups in Western Australia. In fact, he says what we're saying about all these pressures are just scaremongering. Well, I tell you what, if he was a small businessman and had to put his hand in his pocket, with all of the other cost of living and cost of doing business expenses to find another $15,000 to comply with this, he would not see it as scaremongering because it is the truth. And a poll taken by the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Western Australia is the first in the country to reveal the true sentiment of Australian businesses uh, to these reforms. And it revealed this. More than nine in ten Western Australian businesses fear impending change to industrial relation laws, and only eight per cent said they were unconcerned by the changes. Thirty four thousand workplaces would employ fewer staff if they were no longer able to set their own work conditions and were replaced by the Fair Work Commission. Twelve thousand businesses would employ fewer people if limits on fixed term contracts were put in place as is proposed by those opposite. And more than four in 10 businesses would scale down operations if forced into multi-employer bargaining or immediate bargaining for a new agreement when the existing one expires. This, more than any of the other destructive elements of their act, is the most duplicitous, because this was not in the Labor Party policy that they took to the election. They had a a uh, sort of a, a workforce uh, summit, and guess what? Surprise, surprise! This popped out of the union's mouths. The Labor Party said, "Oh, we didn't think of that before the election, but let's implement it and let's destroy our businesses." Shame on you, Labor. Senator Sheldon. You know, we just hope we come to a situation here in the Senate where we get a number of speakers from the opposition who get up and talk about industrial relations. In actual fact, they even have the high to talk about being representative of small businesses. 
Senator Stoll, Stoll set them straight. In actual fact, I have the great pleasure of saying I was the head and elected the head of the largest small business organisation in this country, which is the Transport Workers Union of Australia. Over 15,000 owner drivers. And I know whenever I went into a workplace, I wanted to make sure it was an outcome that that company was successful, the industry was successful, and those workers got a fair deal, whether they're a small business person or whether an employee. What they're really saying is that those big gorillas, the ones that were called out by Steve Knott, all us big gorillas, all those chimpanzees on the other side of this chamber are saying they're going to make sure that they get told by the big gorillas what they're going to do. Because those big gorillas give them bananas, they just won't share it with the rest of the country. Because the fact is, small businesses are getting it done in the neck under these laws that, were, that have been stood over by this government when they were in government, the opposition when they were in government. We have to have a law that turns around and makes sure we can lift productivity. Productivity gets lifted when groups of workers come together and collectively bargain with their employer and, heaven forbid, across an industry. Because I've been in industries and I see industries where employers that are in the middle of the, of the supply chain are continually stood over by the top of the supply chain, the big gorillas that they are protecting. The ones that have the hide to come in here and represent Aki and others, that have turned around and supported not small business, big business. Because I can tell you what, if you really talk to small business and you really find out what small business has to say, they say that the employers that engage them, those economic employers, that's their problem. Because they're the ones that don't turn around and make sure their payments are made on time. They're the ones that give them 120 days. They're the ones that turn around and say, I can't train my staff because it's a race to the bottom. I can't turn around and give them a pay increase to give my experienced staff in the business because my competition will go lower and it's a race to the bottom. You only have to go to Alan Joyce to see that. Now that's the big gorilla because that's the people they are supporting. That's the people that they're supporting. And don't just say that. It's not just them. It's not, actually, it's not even just Alan Joyce. It's actually companies like Amazon, these international companies that are actually competing with small and other businesses that are stealing their arrangements because what they're doing is they're undercutting. They're undercutting by turning around and having multiple labour hire companies, having very few people on decent wages, refusing to have bargaining arrangements. They sack people because they're pregnant, sack them because they're in a union, sack them when they try to organise. That's the people they're standing up for. They don't want the system changed. No, wait a sec. They do want the system changed. Because what they said, only in this last number of days, and again this morning, Angus Taylor said the system's working OK. Wages aren't going up. That's why I say it's working OK. Angus Taylor says the system's working OK. Because small business are getting done over by those big gorillas because they can't keep and train their staff. Because they can't get the wages across their markets. And sometimes that's even negotiations across government contracts. They have to have the capacity in the private and government sector to be able to bargain when they want to, when there's an appropriate way to do that. And I want to means that workers have a right to say that, as business has a right to say that. And parties have a right and obligation to come around and negotiate an agreement. If an employer says, I want to negotiate an agreement across the site, they have a right to do that. If an employee, more than 50% plus one, says, I want to negotiate an agreement across the site, they have a right to do that. Heaven forbid. That is where you have equal actual voice. That's where you have equal opportunity. That's where you can turn around and start moving wages up. And when wages go up, people start talking about how to make it more efficient, more effective, better training, better skills, and heaven forbid, productivity goes up. You've only got to look at the ACHC um, uh, Association that gave evidence to the inquiry. You only have to look at what was said by the Victorian uh, childhood, um, the, uh, the early childhood educators and their, their association, the Employer Association. They said that's how they actually got better conditions, better arrangements, not just for the workforce, but they all got together. These small, multiple employers got together and turned around and said, let's do it together. And the last big myth, this supposed that rent, uh, Minister Senator Reynolds was talking about this $15,000, it was in place right now without any law change. Thank you. The fact Thank is you, you make Senator a choice Shelby. whether you want to do it or not. Senator Antic. Thank you. Um, Mr Deputy President, I, I, I was loath to 
stand up and interject there because uh, Senator Sheldon was recounting what appeared to be a game of Donkey Kong Country there with his analogies about gorillas and bananas. And I, I, was, I was a bit lost there in the, uh, the theatre of it all. But I'll tell you what I'm not lost on, and that is the radical, dangerous and ill-conceived rushed bill that we're seeing through our parliament coming through uh, as we speak, Mr Deputy President. These are um, changes which represent the most significant change in our industrial relations system in decades. And uh, they, they are ultimately uh, changes which are going to do exactly what we all know. This is, not, this is not a Super Nintendo, this is not a game of Donkey Kong Country. This is a very serious, serious matter. And what it is, is the first stages in handing back the keys uh, to this country, to the militant union movement, uh, which we are already seeing. We are already seeing this in, uh, in South Australia, where the reports already are of the John Setka-led uh, uh, CFMEU uh, have now taken the reins of the South Australian branch and are starting to swing the axe already. And why wouldn't they? Because they've now got Labor governments both at state and federal level, both of whom are paving the way for what we know is going to be a terrible time for business. This is not an issue of people talking about their personal stories, which are excellent stories, as, uh, as Senator Stirl um, uh, spoke of, of, uh, of uh, what it was basically a small business story. But these are stories about the imposts that are going to be put on business, and we've heard them. We've heard them from um, the Albanese government's regulatory impact statement, which has said very clearly that the costs associated with this bill are going to be significant. $14,000, $14,638 for small businesses and $75,148 for a medium business. Um, th that ain't small bananas. Uh, Mr Deputy President, they are serious, serious imposts and they're real. They're not made up. They are absolutely real and they're now, they're now written down. So Labor have made it clear they don't care about small businesses. Small businesses do well for workers when they're profitable and they don't do well when they're getting hit with sums of money like that. They've made it clear that they're going to hand over all workplaces to the union, whether they be small or large. And industry-wide bargaining is, is simply set now to increase the number of strikes across the economy. That, we, we've seen this before. Uh, we saw it through the, the Hawke-Keating year, and we're going to see it again. This is going to be devastating for the Australian economy. It's going to be devastating for Australian businesses uh, with widespread strike action and uh, potentially sympathy strikes by those unrelated to a potential dispute. We, we saw this in the 1970s, Mr Deputy President. It, it, it has happened before, and history is repeating ourselves. Everyone in this room wants higher wages uh, for, every, for every Australian, but there is no evidence that the reforms will ever deliver higher wages. And, and in fact, um, what we know is that based on the comments from uh, businesses, from employers, that the evidence is that it will be quite the opposite. Uh, this is just the fact. Labor's legislation is going to lead to more strikes, more job losses. It's going to allow unions into small businesses, which have, which have really never had to deal with them before. Some of these businesses, like, for example, Crane Services, uh, it was reported uh, last week uh, in the Adelaide Advertiser, a fine publication. As you all know, I'm a great fan of it. Uh, that's me being... That's ironic, by any way, in case anyone wants to hear that. But that's not on point. We'll come to that later on. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the boss of an Adelaide crane company told that newspaper that the livelihoods of the workers are at stake as they stand off with the militant CM, CFMEU. Uh, at, as it neared the end of its fourth day at that stage. This is a family-owned business. Just like the story that Senator Searle told about a family-owned business, this is a family-owned business that is now going to be stood over by Mr Setka and his colleagues. We'll use that, that terminology in these terms. Uh, absolutely no, no question about that. We have similarly unreasonable demands for uh, conditions which really 25 per cent wage rise in one year. Businesses can't stomach this sort of... Uh, knee-jerk uh, reform. Um, these laws are also going to hold up wage rises, of course, because of the complexity of the system. Um, we're seeing now uh, more imposts put on businesses who are now going to have to get to grips with various different systems. This is going to undermine competition. Australians are going to have few choices and therefore fewer choices and therefore higher costs. It's going to force up prices and increase the cost of living, all, all by the way, Mr Deputy President, at a time where the country uh, cannot afford that. We are living through uh, thanks, to, uh, uh, thanks to the conditions imposed here, growing inflation, 
uh, higher cost of living, higher energy costs. We've got lots of batteries and wind farms, though, which is good. Lots of batteries and wind farms. They're, they're doing a great job for the grid, by the way, while we're Thank on the you, subject. Senator. Thank you, Senator Antique. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note to uh, responses to my questions to uh, Senator Wong. I'm very proud to be standing in the Senate today asking on behalf of the Australian Greens the hard questions to this government on an issue that matters to millions of Australians. I know a lot of senators in this chamber have received correspondence in recent weeks around the collapse of Red Cycle, a soft plastic recycling facility. People are furious. They are furious and frustrated after all these years of doing the right thing, collecting their soft plastics, which, by the way, they have no choice about at all, collecting their soft plastics, taking them back to the supermarket and then finding out that they're being stockpiled by a company that actually can't get them recycled. No one's buying the recycled content from the recyclers. And guess what? The big packaging companies that produce this plastic waste, this pollution and the companies that order it to wrap every item just about in your grocery in plastics, which nobody wants, but you get it anyway. You know why? You know why that this scheme has collapsed? You know why we're about to find out that our 2025 packaging targets have also failed? Because the big companies, and this is the, there's a number of reasons, but the key reason is the big companies that produce this stuff just don't give a rat's ass about what happens to it. They really don't. They have no producer responsibility. They do not care. They put it all back onto the consumer. If you use these products, it's up to you to dispose of them. But what's the consumer to do when there's no options? What's the consumer to do? Well, I asked the question to Senator Wong today, why is it seemingly beyond these companies to actually come up with a scheme to recycle these soft plastics properly. And actually, that was based on a quote from our Environment Minister. Out of frustration on the day this was announced, Minister Plibersek said it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be beyond big companies like Coles and Woolworth to come up with a viable solution to soft plastic packaging recycling. You know why they don't care? Because they know the government doesn't care. Because they have, since 1998, under the Australian Packaging Covenant, repeatedly, repeatedly failed to meet even the most basic recycling or packaging waste reduction targets. And they have never once been penalised because this scheme is voluntary. It's always been voluntary. There's been no one in this building or even at a state government level through the COAG process who's been willing to take on the big packaging companies, companies like Coca-Cola, and the big grocery companies, may I say big donors, yes. to the, both the Labor and the Liberal Party, just as a passing comment. But I'll tell you what, it, the Australian people have had enough. Senator Polly, I'll take that interjection, they have had enough of big governments failing to act on this recycling crisis. And we need to ask ourselves, if we find out that the Australian Packaging Covenant, APCO, which is now an accredited voluntary product stewardship scheme under the new Act, if they are not going to meet their 2025 targets, they're three years away, but we were told we would know by the end of this year, if they are not going to, what is the government going to do? Are they going to let this pollution continue? Are they going to continue to let down Australians? I hope they do the only thing they can do to fix this crisis. Step up and regulate these companies regulate these companies like the Greens tried to force in the Senate debate two years ago when the legislation came here. We had a tied vote on mandating these targets so that these companies had no choice but to meet them, and if they didn't, there would be consequences. And I remind the senators, those of you who were here two years ago, that we had a tied vote and it was Senator Hanson that walked away from what a deal we thought we had with her to actually pass mandatory regulatory targets. And uh, the government cast the deciding vote from the chair and we lost that debate. And surprise, surprise, two years later, it looks like we've had a massive failure of soft plastic recycling and we're about to find out that our entire national targets, run by big business, led by big business, through the Packaging Covenant, is also going to fail. 
And I would ask senators to reflect on this as a final point. The Greens aren't going to stop asking the questions on this. We're not going to stop putting up good ideas. We are going to continually needle you till you do something about this. And I say that to both parties. This should be across political lines. Because I tell you, this issue cuts across political lines. All sides of politics want to see better recycling. They want to see waste reduction. They do not want to see plastic pollution in our oceans killing our marine life. I put the question. Those of the questions say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Wish-Wilson, the chair doesn't have a casting vote for your information.